Hello everyone. My name is Ruth Litwin and I am part of the Producers Network at KCAT Las Gatas TV station. And we have an amazing interview today with our guest, Saul Dreyer, who presently lives in Coconut Creek, Florida, and was born in Krakow, Poland. And the story goes on from there. Last year, I also sit on the board of the Jewish Silicon Valley Film Festival. We aired a documentary called Saul and Ruby, Holocaust Survivor Band. And it's an extraordinary story of an 89-year-old man who has a vision and a passion on making a difference. And he decided to start a band. And with that, the airing of the documentary was riveting. And we did a post interview. And before I started asking Saul and Ruby questions about their journey in this documentary, I knew that Saul was from Krakow, Poland. And I asked Saul before the interview, Saul, perhaps the name Michael Chopnik sounds familiar because my father was from Krakow, Poland before the war. Well, a miracle happened. When I told Saul that story, he said, what? Michal was your father? I grew up with your father and we lived doors away from each other in Krakow, Poland. I can't begin to tell you the tears and the joy and the opportunity to learn things that I never knew. Both my mother and father are Holocaust survivors. They were liberated from the camp in 1945, Bergen-Belsen. And when the British liberated the camp, they rebuilt the camp and it became a refugee deep displaced persons camp. Hospitals were built, two hospitals actually, and couples got married children were born. I was one of the 5,000 children that was born in Bergen-Belsen DP camp from 1945 to 1950. So the story of second generation and the continuing story that we hope to reach out to all the populations to have a continuing legacy is why we are here today. And so now I am going to introduce you to Saul Dreyer, who has been with us for the past week. We performed a concert on Sunday with Saul. Over 300 people participated. And while Saul has been a guest at my husband's, my, our home, we have also spoken to several schools about Saul's journey. And so Saul, now I'm going to ask you to talk to our viewing public about how you started your journey with the Holocaust Survivor Band. Okay. Well, I, I was work, I, first of all, my name is Sal Dreyer. I'm 97 years old. I live in the United States that I love. And also, I've got four children. I have eight great children, two adopted, and I've got three great, great children. My family spread all over the world almost. But let me start with me. Maybe sometime at the, by the interview, I will be continue with my family. I work very hard for my, uh, during time being in America. I was raising a family. I have children. And uh, I was living in New Jersey. My wife took sick with her vertical veins, and the doctor suggested my wife should travel to a cold, to a warm uh, climate, and we decided to move to Florida. In Florida, I was working a little bit till I retired. I retired, and I, I was 89 years old. I was sitting one morning and watching my uh, watching on the computer the news and I saw an essay of a woman 106 or 108 years old I don't remember she was a Holocaust survivor 
She was liberated in Theresienstadt, and she was a, a very a wonderful piano player. And she was uh, living in London, and she was playing every day afternoon for the friends or for her, for her neighbors, and she passed away. 350 million people just in the United States. Nobody thought to put together something that's going to make so much interest, going to be successful, very successful. I thought how to put together a Holocaust survivor band. And I would listen to her story, and I told myself, I have to do this in her name. I'm a Holocaust survivor. I, I was living in three concentration camps till I got liberated. And she was living in a propaganda uh, concentration camp to show the world how the German treat all the people that took over during the World War II, Jews, non-Jews, everybody. And you're talking about Theresienstadt. Correct. Anyway, I was thinking about it and I told myself I had to put together a Holocaust survivor band. I wake up my wife and says, Clara, I read something on a tube and I told her the story. I would like to put together a Holocaust survivor band. So my wife says, Sal, you're crazy, period. When she said I'm crazy, I didn't pay too much attention. This was on a Thursday. Saturday, I went to the services for Shabbat. And we had services. After the services, I'm sitting next to my rabbi. And I think I'm going to ask him his opinion. So I said, Rabbi Henry, I would like to ask you something. I want your opinion. And I told him the same story I told my wife. So he was a Holocaust Soviet child, so he spoke a little with the accent. So he said, Sal, you're 89 years old. You've 10 years retired, or 12, I don't remember. He says, what do you need it for? You're crazy. And this got me right into the, my heart. I said, oh no, I said. Two people told, told me I'm crazy. On the contrary, I'm going to do it. Monday morning, I took a blank check. I went into a store where they sell mu uh, music store by name Sam Ash, they're all over the United States. And I walked in, I said, could I talk to the manager? Because I didn't know the, how to go about it. They introduced me to the manager. I said, mister, I would like to buy a set of, play, a set of drums. He says, you, set of drums? He's looking at me, are you a musician? I said, I don't know, but I would like to buy a set of drums. So he says, what do you want? So I said, show it to me. I went through the drums. And I said, I would like to have a full set. So he says, yes, I'm going to give you a five-piece set, plus you can buy some accessories. And he gave me a whole package, and I paid close to $800 I don't remember. So he said, fine. I said, here the check. They gave me a bill and everything. And I load up my drums. I load up on drums. I, they gave me the instruction how to put together everything. I went over with them. I spent approximately an hour and a half. And I'm ready. I'm trapped, sitting in my car, driving. I tell myself, here goes a proud musician playing drums. I come home. I park the car. I live in a condominium. So I, li I live on the fourth floor. So I go upstairs. My wife is with an eight. And the eight sits by her. You know, they talk. She was dressed. Where were you? So I said, well, I tell you to tell my wife, I went shopping. Oh, my God. Took you so long, what did you buy? That is a fact, darling, I tell you something. I bought you a present. She said, you must be kidding. What is it? Oh, one second. The present is big. If you want to see it, you have to come downstairs to the car. My wife was very intelligent, very smart. She smelled something. So she says, I'm dressed. Let's go. We're going down. The car stays. I open the doors. I open the trunk. He says, she says, oh, my God. She, so I say, why are you yelling? She says, very simple. Either you go or the drums go. I was very, very upset. Finally, I make up with my wife. I told her I won't keep the drums in the house. 
I got to put him in a warehouse. Uh, uh, we got this little bins here, uh, where we live. And don't worry, I won't mess up the house. So she agreed. She agreed. Meanwhile, I had to do something. I got set of drums, <laughs> and I don't know what to do. So I go to my rabbi. I said, Rabbi, I would like to rent the synagogue, which we had a synagogue, and next to it we had a reception place where we could sit by 500 people. He bought a building and reconditioned it uh, to synagogues and, and churches where he was renting. She so says, fine, I can give it by sale, it's going to cost money. I said, I understand, you have to get a salmon, you have to set up chairs, we have to clean up the place. I said, Rabbi, whatever it's going to cost, I'm going to give it to you. He says, how much are you going to charge for tickets? So I said, Rabbi, here's the trick, I won't charge nothing for tickets. He says, why? Because I says, if I got charged for tickets, nobody's going to show up. It's going to be free. People are going to come. And that's what happened. We advertised an international concert. I hired, I hired musicians. Some of them were Holocaust survivors. Some of them were children from Holocaust survivors. And my rabbi was renting a, a, not a church next door to a Brazilian church. So I spoke to the pastor and asked him if he would be willing uh, to lend me his orchestra. He said, willing, I told him, he told me how much he gonna charge me. I took care of everything. On the stage, we had two orchestra, a Mexican orchestra <laughs> and a Jewish international, and we gave the name a uh, international concert free of charge. And what I did, I engaged my wife, and I told her, Clara, next Sunday, we're gonna have a concert. I want you to come, you know, uh, I'm playing, I'm going to show you how I play, maybe you like it, don't like it, and somehow I convinced her mo- to come to my concert. And it happened, instead to have 100 people, I had over 450 people showed up. And I set my wife in the front of the stage with the eight, and she brought w- uh, along with, with her, her girlfriend and my daughter. And they're all sitting in the front five people, I, I'm on the stage, and we start, we were practicing before, you know, we had a rehearsal, and we start to play the concert. It took us one hour and ten minutes to finish. We finish with a, with a, with a God bless America. When we finish, everybody finish, I wanted to put together my drums, everything, so my wife made, made with the finger like this to me. So I said, what do you want? I said, come on down. I come down to my wife, and she tells me, Sal, I'm living with you 51 years. I didn't believe. Today, you are my celebrity. <laughs> when she told me that, I became a celebrity. Mm-hmm. And that's how I started the Holocaust Survivor Band. And Sal, I, I have a question for you also. What, when you knew you wanted to start the band, Share with us what your goal was. My goal was to help Holocaust survivors who are, uh, who are underprivileged, who are sick. I wanted to put together young people with the older people to know there was a Holocaust. And I wanted to fight anti-Semitism. These were the three items I was really interested in. And the, another one was where you wanted to go and play. I you wanted were to raising go. money for a special trip. Yes, anywhere. I wanted to go and pl- go play. I said, I want to make sure that I can go to Poland where I was born. And I would like to play there because I would like to play for the six million people who perished through Hitler's years in the war. And this was my aim. And it happened. I got a voice break through a woman from Brooklyn uh, that uh, asked for my card. And she uh, engaged me to play in uh, Las Vegas, in the Venetian Hotel. They were honoring this Sheldon uh, Adelson. Adelson. And with Dudu Fischer, who was artist from Israel. And I came there. I don't want to make a, a short so long. Uh, we, uh, we had a concert there, he had a concert, 
me, we went, I went down, Ruby, Ruby went down with his daughter and a guitarist. I, I had the drums set up there. We started to play without a rehearsal with Dodo Fischer. He took a chair, a bar chair, sat with us, and he started to sing. Bells, my state, all the bells, this was the song, and we continue. After we finish, we got a standing ovation. We got off the stage, and he continued with, the, uh, with his concert. And since then, the whole sky opened for the Holocaust Survivor event. And tell us about your experience when you got to Poland. Well, when I got to Poland, uh, I had I got to Poland. I was in Poland with my wife be before I mm -hmm. had the Holocaust Survivor Band. Then I went to Poland with the band, but not the whole band, a little band. We, we I, my people was Hannah one, Ruby two, uh, Jeff three, and I. I was four. The, we came to Poland. I was interviewed by the television and all over, and finally show a man by the Munoz Staszek. I don't know who he was. He was the leading singer of Warsaw in Poland, and he agreed to play with us. He brought his, his orchestra. The people that took us to Poland had another orchestra, and we were separate. And we all went all on the stage. They were honoring the righteous people, people who saved Jews during the war. And we, uh, the concert was free, and we had 3,700 people outside the ghetto wall playing. A concert took three and a half hours. And after the concert and the people that you spoke to, what were they saying to you, your audience? And you were playing with what you described as the Bono of Poland. Korlek he was a super, superstar celebrity. They were talking, first of all, uh, Munoz Stasek were playing with me, and we brought on the stage the uh, righteous people. So one was, just was his birthday, so we were also singing in Polish, Stola, hundred light he should live, because this man uh, uh, saved 15 Jewish people in his factory. Instead of going to concentration camp, he kept them and they survived. Share a little bit about your experience during the war, Saul, where well, you were. Well, during the war, I, ha I lived in three concentration camp. My first concentration camp was Krakow Plaszow when I was 16, 16 and a half. From then, I was shipped to Schindler's concentration camp where there were three factories, Schindler's factory, then factory that I work, and Taef, and also a mill that they were coding lumber, you know, uh, uh, for, for barracks in Prashov. Over there, I was I, over a year working as a welder. I was welding the radiators for the Messerschmitt for the German aeroplanes. From there, the, the wine ran us up and they liquidated the concentration camp and they liquidated at the same time the Plaszow camp. And they load us up on the trains. A uh, whole day was in August, was very hard. And Schindler came out and gave our order to spray uh, hoses and the, and the cattle cars, we should cool off. You can see this, if somebody saw this, this film, you can see this scene how they, with the spraying water on us, and maybe over 120 cattle cars. And they loaded up. Schindler took, uh, saved 1,400 people from his factory, and they were on the end of the, of the train. And the train took off in the evening. We were traveling, we arrived to Auschwitz. We arrived to Auschwitz, we were sitting on the main uh, line of, uh, on the railroad, and they uncoupled the few uh, cattle cars with the people that were selected for Schindler's, for Schindler's factory, and they were separate, and we were standing. Meanwhile, uh, there the, the was a war in, in Russia, 
in the other wounded soldiers who were coming uh, to, to be recuperated to Germany and they needed the, they needed the truck to pass by. So right away, the, uh, two, three hours later, the train took off. We were riding a whole day, a whole night, and a whole day till we arrived to Mauthausen. And this was my first experience in a big, big, my partial concentration was big, but this was an entirely different concentration camp. This one had diplomats, this had, had prisoners, this was, had everything, German mixed people from the whole world. And that they, they was occupied by the Germans. And over there we came, I was completely undressed, completely the way I was born. And they gave me a pair of pajamas. They gave me a pair of pajamas, so all of a sudden, they give an order that the people that were dressed in pajamas have to go to work. So I went to work with a friend of mine. We were going down 183 steps to a stone quarry. And everybody had to pick up a stone and carry back up 183 steps up to the concentration camp. I tell you that this was one of my biggest nightmares. Why? I was young, I had friends, but all the people who were with me, they had to carry those stones. And on the way up, many of them dropped the stones and either fainted or, or I don't know what happened. Finally, I worked a whole day and I walked a few times with the stones. The second thing, the same thing, till I talked to my friend, I said, listen, this is it. Either I die, either something happened, but I can't do it no more, carry the stones. So he says, you know, so we have to do something. So I says, I got an idea. Let's, let's get completely undressed new, take the pyjama throw to the sewer, because you know, there was no, no toilet facilities. So there was a sewer and everybody was taking care of themselves. And I throw that this to the sewer, it was 12 o'clock at night, probably. And since then, I was walking around youth. I was walking around youth that they want to take me. But God help us. Two days later, trucks arrived with the uniforms that the prisoners were wearing. So we all received uniforms and we didn't work no more until they started to separate all the Jewish people. They, they sent them to four or five different concentration camps. And after, of course, I didn't know nothing about it, but now I know the names and everything. They send them to Melk, Ebense, Steige, and Linz. And one more. I don't remember the name. Yeah. I was fortunate enough, enough because I was a welder. They sent me to Linz because in Linz there was uh, a, a, a factory, how Wechstert uh, in, in Linz, and then needed welders. So this camp had a few welders, people who really had to do with iron. Uh, and I was shipped to this concentration camp. And from there, I was going to work every day, every day to the factory. Of course, every, uh, if there were bombing, we had to go in uh, to the bunkers. But I was working there. And over there, I had a little better life. I don't say a better life. It was better for me because this factory, for good people, they were working very well and they were help. They were uh, uh, fabricating. You know, they were productive. They were paying us by cigarettes. I was uh, 18 years old. I didn't smoke cigarettes, so somehow I found that there was a foreman there. He said to me, "You're gonna give me cigarettes. I'm gonna give you a piece of bread. I'm gonna getting. I'm getting." Uh, packages from my home, a piece of cake, maybe a piece of meat, and somehow whatever, every two weeks I was getting paid by cigarettes, I gave him the cigarettes, and that's how I survived. And so I'll tell us a little bit more now about almost the liberation. Yes. And where that journey took you. Well, I was working in Halbergstätte. I was having, I'm getting cigarettes every two weeks. I was 
I didn't have no pockets in my uniform, so I was between my two legs, I was cutting the cigarettes. Somehow, my capo, we had a capo now, my last barrack in the concentration Saul, camp. Will you, will you describe a capo? I don't yes, know if I, everybody I am knows describing. what a capo my is. My capo was a politician prisoner. In this concentration camp, everybody had a, uh, I'm here carrying a triangle. The Jewish people had yellow. The politician had red. The murderers had black. Uh, the saboteurs had uh, purple. And also the internationals, like from Poland, from Hungary or from Italy, had green. This was the colors that we had in the whole concentration camp. The concentration camp had probably over 2,000 people, I think. I am not sure. Well, we, every day we were marching to work. I was going, and through the time, every two weeks, I was bringing the cigarettes to the capo. He was a capo. And one day, he says, uh, when you're going to come with the cigarettes, I don't, don't want you walking to my quarters. You people got lies. You're dirty. I want you to hand it to me just before the quarters, the cigarettes. I did it once or twice. The third time or fourth time, Ed poured. The rain was impossible. It was raining. And he didn't want to come out. So... He stood by the, opened the door and called me inside. Because the door was, you know, by the door, the rain was coming down. I came inside and gave him the cigarettes. So he didn't have a heart to let me out because it was raining terrible. So I was hanging around there, just staying and looking, watching. In, a, in a, a one wall, there was a little shelf. And on the shelf was, was laying a Jewish uh, trumpet, which is, we call it the shofar. This is the most holy thing in the Jewish, after the Torah, is the shofar, because we blow this for Jewish New Year, and we blow, blow this also for the Jewish attempt, uh, day where we feast 24 hours. It's the ram's horn. Right. right. That is mm -hmm. a horn. And, uh, and I look at it. So he says, what are you looking at? So I says, I'm looking uh, on the horn that's on your shelf. He says, Sa Mr. Sal, I'm going to tell you something. Someday, this horn going to save a lot of people. Got into one ear, come another. What he's talking about, win a war and everything. How a, a Jewish horn, a holy thing can save. Would you believe it that two, but ten days, if before the uh, Americans, so, uh, Americans came to liberate us, the, my factory was bumped, and we never went to work. So we were, we were staying in camp, and they decided to make groups of 100 survivors that worked in this factory and take us on a, on a, to, on a railroad station to repair the, sta the railroad because the American or the Russian boat were bombing there almost every day because they, they wanted uh, the supplies to go to the front. They wanted to finish the German. And one day we go going there in the morning and, and three bombs comes down. And out of my group, we were 100 people, 50 got killed immediately. There were many wounded, the rest of us. Nobody was, maybe two, three people, nothing happened to him. I was wounded too. I was wounded. I lost a finger. Uh, I was wounded my hand. I, have, I had a shrapnel in the back, and I've got a shrapnel in my head. And, uh, but I could walk. My knee would hurt me because I jumped to a pit where they repaired the locomotive the locomotives, and you know, the pit, and I covered myself, so I got hit on the hand. You know, the shrapnels, you know, the pieces of the bomb were, were all over. And they made us walk back to the concentration camp, the people that could walk. So from 100, maybe 35, 40 walked back. We came to the concentration camp, so 
what they did. They do take the wounded people. What happened in the concentration camp was another camp that uh, riot with electric riot, and over there they brought Polish people from Warsaw who were fighting on the ground uh, to this camp, maybe by 500 Polish uh, prisoners, and also whoever was wounded they threw him there. This was an inside camp that they were starving people. They didn't kill them, they didn't burn them, nothing. They had to uh, naturally be uh, got, uh, was starved till they die. And I was there, I told myself, this is it. This is the end. Somehow, some way, somebody helped me. I don't know, I believe God helped me. My couple passed by and, he's, and I was thinking by the wire, look what's going on, if I can escape or something. He says, what are you doing here? So I tell him, I don't know. He stopped, he told the guard, who was a, who was a, a SS soldier, to open and he pulled me out. He pulled me out, I was bleeding and everything, and two or three days he was holding me uh, behind his barracks, and eventually three prisoners escaped. When the three prisoners escaped, the commander, the German commander of the concentration camp was, was very upset because if Hitler would find out they could have put them away or put them in jail because such a thing was one of the voices thing, three prisoners should escape from a concentration camp. But he was very upset, the commander. Following morning, he puts us in a line outside in a, in a place and we, uh, he started to count us. They counted everybody, they saw the three people are missing. So he decided he took all the soldiers who were all the men, you know, and they were walking us away from the concentration camp. He was he he one he punished us, he wanted to punish us, and we didn't know why. Eventually I was in the last barracks, so we were the last one. And as we were walking, my capo had a little rucksack, uh, how you say it? Backpack, backpack. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know nothing about that. What he carried there, nobody pay attention. We walking, we walking. We coming to a big mountain in a cave. And over there started a commotion, why? Because the three escapees knew already they were in contact with the capos, they were in contact with, uh, with, out, with the outside world world, they had the guns already, and started make a big, big commotion. But the Germans were yelling to people to go inside, to go inside, and a few hundred people went into the cave. And the capo turns to me, he says, Sal, here's the horn that you look at, you better blow it. I didn't know how to blow a horn. I, uh, I never blow a horn in my life, I was not almost over 18 years old, almost 19, and started to blow the horn and was a commotion. Poor people go, started to escape from the, uh, how you call it, from the cave. Meanwhile, I, I gave up. I gave him, the, I gave him uh, the horn and I escaped too. I walked back as I'm walking, but three, four, five minutes later, I don't remember, the cave blew out. How many people got killed? How many I saved? I don't know till today. I didn't never saw the capo no more. I don't know if he was Jewish, if he was German. I don't nothing, nothing. I went on the street. I saw the American are coming. They coming. They stopped with the tanks, and the, with the jeeps. I, I saw a guy with a red cross. And then I walked to him, and I said he speaks a little. Uh, German, he spoke, he was from New York, he was a soldier, and I told him who I was, in Jewish, he understood me, and I, I showed him that I'm wounded and everything. He went to his superior, who was also Jewish probably, he told him, you take this man to the hospital, operate him, make sure he was all right. If we leave tomorrow, we're going to stay overnight, but we leave tomorrow, make sure that he's taken care of. So meanwhile, 
there was a house there. There were already a few Holocaust survivors mingled among the Americans. He took me to the house, and people, the, the, German, the German people that were giving out food. So I got a piece of bread, I got a piece of meat, and I ate it. He waited when I finished eating. He took a driver, and he did him, and the driver drove me to the hospital. I went to the hospital. They could put me on the Anastasia. I know nothing about it. I don't remember zero. And when I woke up, I was bandaged on my hand. I was bandaged on both hands. I had a patch here and nothing on the head. And he went, took me to a place so I can stay, and he took a picture. This picture I still got in the, home, um, in the house. I made it bigger. Whoever comes to my house has to see the picture with me wounded, with the uniform, and that's how I survive. Uh, from there on, uh, I was working on a, uh, I gathered already with a few Holocaust survivors. A truck pulled in and asked us who we are. Uh, and we told them I, there was that the truck had uh, the soldiers had uh, a Jewish star on the, on the side of the uniform. So I saw uh, the Jewish star, so I asked him, are they Jewish? They said, yeah, we Israelis. We're fighting with the English together. We stole a few trucks. We want to take, all take you someplace to a better place that you can recuperate it. And they took us to Italy, down to Italy, past Bari, past Barletta, they called the place Santa Maria de Bani, Santa Maria de Luca. They joined the Jewish agents in America, make a deal with the two cities to bring us and help us to recuperate it. And I was living in Italy five years before I came to the United States. That's it. And here is your story. And you came to the United States. You met Clara, your wife. Correct. And then your journey from your raising your children, your career, and then your passion for music. music. Because my father was a musician too. My father played piccolo, clarinet, and saxophone. He was playing on weddings. He was playing on bar mitzvahs. Um, uh, any occasion that he could play, besides that he was an officer in the Polish army. And we have been to several schools um, in the valley, and Saul has shared his story. And many of the questions that the children are asking, how old were you when you started to play drums? Well, <laughs> I, I was, as a matter of fact, I tell you the truth, I would, like to, uh, I would like to surprise you with something. Being in the concentration camp, we have a man who sank he was a singer. And this man was singing every day that we were coming from work. And I was laying on the table and listening with the guys that, that they were singing. And I saw something was missing. And, and this was in Schindler's factory. I don't remember where, in the Schindler and Prashov. I had a friend, a gentile, who was working in, the, in a factory and he was helping me with bread, with, uh, with everything. He had his, his lacquer there and I, had, and I had the combination. But I could have gone only to his lacquer on a Friday because Friday there were no Germans there. You understand? So he was safe that they won't catch me there, do something harm to me. So I said to him, Stasek, I need a, a spoon. I got an old wooden stoop and I can't eat the soup, what they gave us. So he says, Friday go to the thing, you're going to find a spoon. So Stato gave me one, he gave me two spoons. Those are the replicas, two spoons I had. So as I was laying on the preach and listening how they sing, I took the two spoons and put it like this in my hand and <laughs> the, the replica needs to be it's hard to you know yeah. let me do it okay
and they were singing. All right, and I said, la 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 one morning arrives a truck and the commander of this displaced person camp was a English officer. He made sure that we being entertained because we were the boys and girls. Every night we went to a hall and was singing. There was no music, no dancing, nothing. And they brought a truck. The truck brought a piano and a set of drums. So they unloaded in the place, and we come in the evening, the commander comes in, he asks, who would like to, who knows how to play a piano? So one guy right away put his hand, he says, the piano is yours, you play because you people going to entertain yourself. Who, gone, who was willing to play the drums? There was nobody. Nobody wanted to touch, to, to touch the drum, till finally I said, I am willing to play the drums because I was playing the spoon, so I figured out maybe I will somehow play the drums. And I, I volunteer. When I volunteer, I got together with the, with the guy that played the piano, and every night we were playing. Uh, he was playing dancing music, and I played boom, 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 and learned how to play the, uh, the drums. Eventually, one night we were playing, as we were playing, he fell down on the, on the, how you call it, on the piano. I got scared. I thought he died. So he had a wife. So I wife ran to him and she said, don't worry, he's got epilepsy. I didn't know what epilepsy was. I was 18 and a half, 19 years old. So finally I got used to it and I was playing and learning how to play drums for a year and a half. Maybe longer, maybe two years. Then I came to the United States and I never touched a drums till I was 89 years old. When I told you that I put together the Holocaust Survivor Band. And somehow I became a master of the trade. I'm playing drums, I playing with orchestra, I, I learned how to dirigate, and I'm a full pledged founder of a Holocaust Survivor Band. Finally, many Holocaust survivors passed away. I believe today, which if it's truth, I believe it, that I think I'm the oldest Holocaust survivor who still plays an instrument with a band. That's my story. And Saul, there's a bit more to your story. Yes. Because as a Holocaust survivor and the people that you have met through all the cities and all the children that you have spoken to, one thing that you have shared and I think really is important that you survived through the most unimaginable horrors. Correct. Lost your family. Correct but there was always some kindness from people who saved you. And an act of kindness is an important message yes. for many of our youth today and yes. for our people everywhere. Well, With respect and kindness, you will be able to overcome. And you have definitely shown that to us. Well, I tell you what I did. I met certain people that were very good to me. I don't have no enemies. They love me, whatever I do, whatever I play. And I, I know a family that one of the, the members of the family, a woman, helped me a lot. And she came with that idea we should put together a foundation. And she put there was a, we got a foundation that we did it in Poland. She lives in Poland. And the, the foundation, they gave the foundation name under my name, South uh, uh, 
Generation. Generation Foundation. The foundation is existing now. It's very young. We just open it. Uh, we have to sign papers and and the Polish uh, the Polish uh, agency approved it. Now we're gonna open uh, uh, the same foundation in America, uh, so we can collect some money for certain causes, and those are the causes. Number one, I want to put together young people with all the people you should know there was a Holocaust in, in, the, in Europe. This is number one. Number two, I would like to do one thing. I would like to help Holocaust survivors continue what I'm doing. Number three, I want to make sure there won't be no anti-Semitism in how long I live and the whole world because we all got the same heart beating our body. We're all the same. White, black, red, green, doesn't matter. But we one people in the world. And number four, I would like to help the mentally sick. This is my aim. That's why I put together the the foundation and that's what I'm, I'm working on and I'm knocking myself out I'm gonna play music till I die and I want to make sure that somehow I can help the world and I got a slogan I got one slogan that I registered in my heart wherever I go I say people repeat after me never again never again never again thank you Saul so thank you your story is a living legacy. It will be shared and heard by many. And all that you are passionate about has now been heard. Thank and you. I applaud you for your endurance, your spirit, your kindness. Thank you. And you have been a gift to us all. Now, could I thank you for it? Ladies and gentlemen, whoever here, I. I found a good friend in Ruti and her husband, Stanley. I didn't believe that I'm going to fly 3,000 miles from Florida to Silicon Valley and find such a beautiful people. I haven't got no more words. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I love you, my mom.